Welcome to Winchester Community Church. It can be hard to see the truth behind the beauty of things the world puts for us. It can be dangerous not to. Let's talk about that. And speaking of poison fruit, that's the title today, Deadly Fruit and Life-Giving Help, this is actually a, a monument on the highest point, you'll laugh, the highest point in, on the island of Bonaire, which is about 80 miles off the coast of Venezuela, uh, is 360 feet. Oh, wow. <laughs> what are we at? 4,000? Mm -hmm. But that is a monument, a memorial. It, uh, it says it's dedicated to Christ. It says it in Latin and a couple of other languages. This is a very uh, dry island. And so the greenery you see is kind of unique. But notice this tree back here. It has, it's called an apple tree. It's called an apple tree. And on that apple tree are these little green, and, and they start to turn a little red and yellow. You guys have had apples like that, right? Here's the thing about what you take in. It may look good to begin with, just like that tree looks really good. And in fact, you might be inclined to maybe stand under it if it was raining outside or just to get out of the sun. You notice nobody's standing under it? There's a reason why. It's called the death apple. The, the uh, Spanish have an even cooler name for it. It's the Manzanilla de la Muerto. The apple of death. Little apple of death. In the Macanil is what we call it. It's one of the most toxic trees in the world. So it has a sap that comes out of it. If you stand underneath it in the rain, or even sometimes in the, in the when it's hot, the sap drips off and it burns your skin. If you eat the fruit, it causes your throat to swell up and you die from asphyxiation. Um, you get it in your eyes, you go blind. Lovely, huh? In fact, there's only one character that actually eats this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, you know, I'm thinking about, and Shannon is the one who came up with this idea, so I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Doesn't that, that remind you of original sin? It looked really good, right? And Satan is selling this idea of, well, you'll be like God. And she bit it, or she bought it, and then she bit into it. Whatever it was. We don't know it's an apple. That's one of the common traditions. But the one who really seals the deal, of course, is Adam. He jumps in and goes, yeah, I'll have some of that. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Sin looks really good in the short term, but the power it has over our lives causes a great deal of damage and has destruction for us here as well as potentially for eternity. So, and there's always some lizard out there, right? You might love it, but uh, we know that God says it impacts all of us. Now, let's take a look at some scriptures. Romans 6.16 talks about this. One of the things about sin is it makes us slaves. And of course, we're supposed to be home of the free and land of the brave, and yet we buy into slavery, just like every other human being. It doesn't make us different. Does it say Titus? No, Titus is next. 6.16, Romans 6.16 first. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And this is at the core of Paul's argument about what rules in your life. Do you serve God, or do you serve something else? Something else is sin. God is the right path. But Christ is the center of this. We'll get to that as we go along. Now, we can take a look at Titus 3, starting at verse 3. So that's towards the back here in New Testament. In Titus 3, it talks about where we came from. And although we love to think of ourselves as being oh so bright and oh so clever, oh so good. As we read along here, Titus 3.3. 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves, like we were just talking about, to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness of the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
Yeah. Man's wisdom is foolishness to God and ignores God's truth, such as beautiful sin actually has a corrupting, evil, destructive influence in our lives. And then finally, let's look at John 8, chapter 8, starting at verse 34. John 8, starting at verse 34. So this is uh, Jesus having a little encounter with the Pharisees here. And they've said, how dare you say anything against us? We're the offspring of Abraham. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, and you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. And by the way, it goes on to explain that their father is the devil. They like to have a pretense of righteousness, but it's their own righteousness, being their own little gods, serving their own father, who is Satan. Humanity is enslaved by sin, and it's destroying us. It has been since the beginning. It will continue to do so. And early, that's when we were talking about praying for things in the world. Yes, we should absolutely pray, but it is such a challenge. Only God can work. We can't save ourselves by good works. How often do you hear that? Well, on balance, I'm pretty good in that, right? This lie of a balance beam or of a scale has been given to us, and we love it because the flesh loves to be the one who saves ourselves, but we can't. And, and what else do we love to do? We love to have rituals, right? I've known people who think they were saved because they had good church attendance or because they had been baptized in a specific church. That's not what saves you. The Jews thought it was the temple system, and they, although the, many of them were being obedient in it, that was just a picture of the ultimate sacrifice that would be made by Jesus. It's not about us. It's not how much better we look than anybody else. We can't save ourselves. Only Jesus can. He's the perfect sacrifice. We read about that in Hebrews 9. Many of you may remember some of these. This, this book is an interesting book. It's written primarily to the Jews. That's why it was named Hebrews. The early church was mostly made up of Jewish converts who saw Jesus as that promised Messiah. And so in Hebrews 9, we read, but when Christ appeared as a high priest, so this is after he's died, he's come and he can serve as the high priest, a high priest of good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, and they're talking about the body, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. Again, that's the picture of the temple. There's the outer courts, and then the inner courts, and then the holy place, and then the holy of holies. How did he enter into the holy places? Not by means of the blood of goats and calves, that's the old sacrificial system, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Why? Because he lived a sinless life, the only one to do so. And his death was undeserved. And so he could pay that price. He could, he could put that on our account because it was not deserved and he did not need to pay that debt. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of the heifer, that's part of the temple process of forgiving sins, at least temporarily, sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He's talking there about dead works. In this case, specifically about the rituals of the temple, but that's true of anything we do. We can create our own little religion, our own little self. Oh, I get up and I do this. Oh, I give, I do, I, 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 I. When we're doing our rituals without God in the midst, it's our rituals. We're the God, we're replacing God. So we have to be careful. Sometimes some of the best works look like that fruit, right? Looks great on the outside, but what's the nature of it? What's the truth of it? If it's still inspired by sin, it will bring about corruption. It will bring about death. But what we want is life, right? Freedom. And there's some excitement in this. One of my favorite chapters in all the Bible is Romans chapter 8. 
There is therefore now no condemnation. Perhaps you know it by heart. In verse 1, chapter 8, verse 1 of Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation by those who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus is the key. A lot of people want to say, well, you know, I said some magic words, but I do what I want. But I'm going to lay claim to all these. No. If you are submitted to and following Christ, then this is yours. You can own this. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us and walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Now many of you have read that and maybe you get lost in it. So I pulled out the message version. Maybe this works for you. This is from the message version of the Bible. With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. That's the summary of 1 and 2. Now here's the summary of verses 3 and 4. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of a struggling humanity in this dark world in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it was always by a fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for, but we couldn't deliver, is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, trying to do more, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us, thanks to Jesus Christ. Jesus, God the Son, took on humanity, became holy man, holy God, to share with us the life that we live, to be a good high priest, to be the only sinless sacrifice that could cover all of our debts. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling, right? But we hear it enough that we often think, well, yeah, okay, super, right? And it becomes little to us, but it's big, it's central. This is the only way for us to be free, the only way to get away from that poisonous fruit of sin that even when it looks good, it isn't, it corrupts, and it kills. Colossians 2 talks about this also, and I pulled this out of the Message Bible. Law. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it. All sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, the debt paid, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. Jesus took captive those who would take us captive. It's pretty amazing. Here's some of the basics of sin and freedom. Here we go. Recognize this? Law of sin or the law of science. Anyway, okay, let's go back to the basics of sin and freedom. That didn't work as well as I'd hoped. <laughs> if we live in sin, we are slaves to sin. That's pretty simple, isn't it? We've already talked about that. Without Jesus, you can't escape that sin, that slavery. Romans 5.8 is a great one. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus laying down his sinless life for us in our sin-corrupted lives pays that price. First Peter talks about that a lot in verses chapter 1, 18 through 19. Jesus' blood covers our sins because without that shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. We read that in Hebrews 9, not too long after where we were just reading earlier. And in Jesus we can be freed from a lot of things. We read in John 8, 36 and elsewhere, the penalty of sin. That's the thing we think about the most. We can be freed from the penalty of sin. In the penalty of sin, 
what we tend to see is, I'm sorry, that effect that we were talking about. The penalty of sin is death, right? We read that in Romans 6.23, Romans 3.23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the first thing that gets set aside as we say, Jesus, be my savior. I submit to you. But there's more. The power of sin, we're also reminded, is set aside. We now have the opportunity to decide, will I follow God or will I follow something else? And something else always takes us into Satan's kingdom, no matter how good it might look. So we're free from the penalty of sin, we're free from the power of sin. And one day, ultimately, we'll be free from the presence of sin. And that's where we were looking here. Um, some of the places that we see this at work. You know, this is an old picture. Some of you probably have seen it. Maybe you even shared it, right? Man's problem is sin. Seeking eternal life over eternal death. The only way to do that is Christ's payment on the cross. God's purpose was to reconcile us to him. He wanted a relationship with us, but he also gave us free will, which meant that we have a choice. Christ or our own self, our own works. Our own works won't make it. We can't bridge that divide. But because of Jesus, if we're in him, if he is our savior, we can. And that is the good news in a nutshell. Freedom now and forever through Christ. And this is relevant to what we're doing today with communion because there is a tree of death, just like the manzanita tree, the manzanilla tree, the little tree of death we were talking about, the death apple, or the Ikea, or some of these others, right? The good-looking evil that lures us to death, that is sin, versus the tree of life. We don't typically use that with Jesus, but it is implied in some places, and it is true. He is the source of life for us. He is where we can go to be free of that death and that corruption and that slavery. But here's something else to consider, too, because the American population tends to be absolutely enamored with self-esteem. How do I feel about myself? I have low self-esteem, thus I commit murder or whatever the excuse is today, right? But God has value. He values us. That's the amazing thing to me. Why would you value us? Why didn't you just remake this mess? Well, clearly he had a plan, right? We know he had a plan before the beginning of time. But that plan meant that there would have to be a price paid. And that price was Jesus Christ. It doesn't make sense to us until we begin to think of it in the context that we understand. Would you sacrifice your child your friend, your spouse, for the people who most hate you. Right? No. I, I, I would be shocked if Sarah goes, yeah, go ahead, kill Jordan, right? No, we don't, no. God knew that was the case. That was in the plan. That's the value he puts on us. Do we deserve it? No. But does he love us anyway? Yes. It wasn't a little fine, it wasn't a big fine, it was a life. And of course, I don't think we can even appreciate it that much because this is God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. They've been together in this trinity, this unity. You can't see forever because it's outside of time. And then Jesus for a time is separated on the cross because of the sin he takes on. It's amazing. What is your value to Christ? Because as we begin to realize that, we have hope in him, too. And in that cost behind the value that we see is the blood of Jesus, which we celebrate in communion. I have a quote here from a couple authors who talks about the value, our value to God. God the Father believed it was worth the ultimate price, the shed blood of his only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to purchase you and me out of our slavery to sin. Though others might look at you and consider you worthless, it's not true. Your true value is determined by the price that your creator, the one who knows and loves you, 
was willing to pay in order to have a relationship with you and to spend eternity with you. That's something to think hard about. That's something to thank God for. And that's part of why we meet. That's part of why we remember communion. That's why we have hope. Because it's not our frailty that carries the day. It's God's strength, God's love, God's grace. And that effort to reconcile us to him. That is our power. That is our hope. That is the promise we live by. It's not the poison of the sin around us. It's the life that comes through this very powerful, valuable gift God has given us. Let's pray. Father, I don't know that we would have even the inkling on the best day of what this truly means. But I know that your spirit can work, and I pray that he does. May the Holy Spirit move widely in us to show us that great divine that came because of sin in our lives, because of not just our frailty, but of our choices to seek after things other than you. May our hearts, our minds, our spirits turn to you, shed the things like that outer skin of the Achaean fruit. That it's only the good that remains, and that good only comes because of Jesus. We thank you for him. We thank you for the work and the cost that's involved, even though we don't have more than a glimpse of what that means. May you change hearts and minds, we pray, Father. May we be more like your son. May we be more in love with you because of the love you've shown us. And may you be glorified. May the works of the enemy be cast down by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in each life here and in the families they represent. And may you be lifted up, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. God loves us and values us. If you want to know more, if you need to know more, you can contact us through a variety of ways. Please do. We're praying for you. Will you pray for us?